Thank you, Lon. How's everybody doing? Good. Uh, we got to do better than that. If I'm the last one, and I got to wrap this thing up. We got to do better than that. How's everybody doing? Good. That's what I want to hear. All right, Lon asked me to give a little background about myself. Um, real quick, um, I was actually a criminal justice major undergrad. Thought I wanted to be a state trooper. I was going to go to Marines, do some time there, you know, figure out my life from there, just go on. Then I was like, ah, I really, honest to God, I really go, I don't want to get shot. Like, I'm not, that's not for me. So I have a lot of respect for, when I see military people, I have a lot of respect for them because they're doing something I don't want to do. So then I talked to my uh, football coach, and they all came from Springfield College up in Springfield, Massachusetts. And I was like, I like the weight room. Maybe I want to be a football coach. Well, I interned with them one year. I found out real fast I don't want to be a football coach because I really can't recruit high school kids because I'm not in the stroke of egos. I'm going to tell you the way it is, and that's kind of how my presentation is going to be. I'm going to say some things that may offend people. It's not that I'm saying it's wrong. It's just not for me. It's just not for my facility. It's just not for Colorado football. Um, fast forward a little bit, went to Springfield College, did an internship at Maryland under Dwight Galt, who's now the head guy at Penn State. Uh, graduated, went down to Auburn, Kevin Yoxel, did an internship down there. Um, he's, I think he's at Rice, but I'm not sure. Um, from there, I didn't know what I was going to do. Went down to Florida State, going to be a GA. They actually said, well, you already have your master's, so you can't be a GA. So I was like, all right, I'll just be an intern. Hopefully I get a recommendation if I do a really good job. Uh, got an assistant spot at Kansas from there, was there about a year and a half. Actually uh, applied for a job at UConn. I want to get back to the East Coast because that's where my wife's from. Got denied. First time I was ever told no in this field. Humbling. Why? Because I wasn't ready. Thankful that Coach Jerry Martin, who's since passed away from cancer, told me no. Made me a better coach. I went back and said, I need to work on things. Job came open a year later. Applied again. Got the job. Was there for five years. Then I went on to be the head guy at Maryland for five years. You know how did the business is. You don't win enough. They ask you to move on. And then luckily enough, this job opened. Knew some people that knew Coach Mack and worked some magic. And luckily, I fooled them enough on my interview that he hired me. And it's going to my second season. So that's my long version of a sh short story. Just want to thank uh, Hammer Strength just for putting on these clinics. You know, I think they're really good. I like the smaller clinics. I don't go to a lot of big clinics. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. I think you get more out of the smaller clinics. I think you can network more. I think that's what this is for. Um, I'll probably have some new best friends. They don't know it yet after these clinics, just from presentations and stuff, because if you strike something in my mind, I'm going to become your new best friend. I'm going to bug you, and I'll, and I'll give you a story on one of the guys that's helped me out a lot. Uh, thank Lon just for asking me to do this. Blair as well. They both asked me if I would do this. I said it's in my own backyard, so I, I need to do it. Thanks, Scott, for allowing us to be here. Great facility. First time seeing it. It's freaking awesome. You know, weight rooms are getting more outrageous and everything, but look around this place. It has what you need to get better. And then thank you guys just for listening. Hopefully I don't bore you. And like I said, disclaimer, just because I say it's not for me or for what I do at CU, doesn't mean I'm saying it's wrong. And I'm going to give you reasons why there's certain things. Because part of me, I'm becoming, the, I'm 38. So I'm not, I don't think I'm that old, but I'm getting older. I'm starting to feel like I'm becoming like the grumpy old guy that's getting mad at a lot of shit that's out there. And, oops, I, uh, we're going live, sorry. A lot of stuff that's going on out there. Um, because I'm very simple and believe in the basics. I believe the basics work. So bear with me. You'll understand why at the end. Influences. First one, my wife. Um, Ten years ago, I would never do a presentation. Why? I don't like talking in front of people. I don't like really talking to people, but being a strength coach, I got to talk to a lot of people every single day. So she finally convinced me to start talking. It's going to help make friends and things like that. I'm not really that guy, but I try to be. But she's been a great influence. She works with children who have autism. Hardest job in America. I'd rather go to work and work 24 hours straight than ever do her job. If you ever met a child with autism, I don't think they have a disability. I think just they're a little different. Everybody's a little different in some way or another. But she, some taxes that she uses with her children, with the children she works with, I use with my own kids. They just don't know it. Dr. Margaret Jones, she gave me a GA even when I didn't even have my degree in exercise science. Just because I was an intern in the weight room, a GA that was leaving vouched for me and said, you need to make him a GA. He's going to do a really good job. And he convinced her, and she gave me a GA. Dwight Galt, like I said, in Maryland. Got there, was a snot-nosed intern, thought I knew everything. Didn't voice it, just in my mind. I'm like, ah, he's doing that. He paired Olympic lifts with 
other things. I said, you know what, Drew, shut up in your head. Find out why. Found out why. Time. Didn't really realize because you're reading all these books, all this and that. That's all great to do, but time constraints. Kevin Yoxel went down to Auburn. I heard him talk at an NACA clinic. I think it was in December. I knew I'd do another internship. As soon as I heard him talk, I said, I am going to Auburn somewhere or the other, and I'm going to find a way to fund it so I can go intern for him because I just liked what his program was about, toughness, discipline, and the basics. Jason Lascazzo, he was actually assistant at Auburn, became very good friends with him. We were great friends to this day. He is a like, true blue on and off the field. We played Washington State. It was coming down to the Pac-12 South last year, and he goes to me, hey, brother, win or lose, it's all good between me and you. This is just a game, and that's what I like to hear. Sometimes I think we get all involved. Yes, we want to win, but these are our resources all out here. Use each other. John Jost gave me, a, uh, gave me you know, Internship, which eventually became a restricted pay earns, made $300 a month at Florida State. I'm in debt to him, has taught me a lot about managing a staff, which is very, very difficult to do. You think you can do it from an assistant spot? You think you got all the answers when you're hitting live bullets and you're the head guy? It's a little different. Chris Dawson hired me at Kansas, very influential guy in my career. Like I said, Jerry Martin, he passed away, uh, a few, uh, I believe it was two years ago. Worked with him for five years. And you want to talk about a grumpy old man? That's a grumpy old man, but he's one of the smartest men I've ever met in my entire life and could take the most complicated thing and break it down so not so smart guy like myself could understand. I learned a lot from him, and I didn't really realize it until I take on the head reins how much he influenced me. Uh, Chris Doyle, never worked for the guy, but I'll tell you what, emailed him one day out of the blue at UConn, hey, Coach Doyle, do you have any books I could read? Emails me back. Relationship ever since then. Anytime I email about anything, I see him at the conferences, talk to him. He is an open book, open door policy, somebody I would try to get in touch with if you guys already don't. Justin Guy is assistant on my staff. He handles all our speed training. He has taught me so much in, and he was with me at Maryland, so in about three years, about speed training that you're never gonna get from a book. And that's kind of kind of be about my talk too. Cam Davison. Anybody know who Cam Davison is? Works at Penn State with hockey has never coached football. I like guys that don't coach football a lot because I like to learn different things. I thought I knew about Olympic lifting. I didn't know shit. Cam Davison basically broke it down and I'm a better Olympic lifting coach to this day because of him. I'm in debt to him for a lot of things and I'll talk a lot about him in my presentation. I'm Mark Uyama. I met him one time when uh, the 49ers uh, came to Maryland to train and he spent, talk about a selfless guy, I said, hey, coach, you mind if we talk shop? He's like, yeah, stay as long as you want. Just need to ride back to the hotel. We spent three hours talking shop on his time and just been staying in touch with him. He gives me, tells me books to read. He's a very intelligent man, once again, who can break things down for a guy like me to understand because everybody say, oh, who's read super training? Everybody raises their hand. They say, who understands super training? Maybe two hands stay up. A guy that can really understand super training. <laughs> that book gives me a headache. I don't think I've opened it in two years. Um, weight room culture. That's what I believe in. I believe I'm in a relationship business. I don't believe in that iron out there. I, just a medium for me to connect with the kids. This is why I talked about the first team meeting. These kids had never met me yet. Had a whole agenda of what we're gonna talk about. Discipline accountability. I said, show up on time and work your ass off. We're never really gonna have a problem from there. I'm gonna treat you all like men until you give me a reason not to. Why? They're 18. Think about this. Some of these kids come from single family homes. Some of these kids don't have a father in their life. So their mother has looked at them as the male figure in the household. Here comes me, a 38 year old man's gonna tell him what to do when he has lived a rougher life than all I could ever dream of. And then all of a sudden I'm telling him what to do. It's not gonna be so easy. Gotta build that trust. So like I tell him, treat you like a man to give me a reason. If it says 10, I don't, I don't believe in counting reps. But I know, everybody knows the guys, and I say guys because I only work with male athletes, that don't work really hard. If I count your reps, and I catch you more than once, then I'm going to babysit you. Then I'm going to tell you, you're up. One, two. I even took one of our back at defensive tackles. 300-pound guy acts like he can't clean 235 pounds because he didn't really feel like lifting that day. I said, guess what? Our racks are... Rack 12's on the far side, rack 1's on the front side. This is the strong guys lift here and so on and so forth. Get Strong Island is rack 12. I said, you, rack 3, go to rack 12, do their weight. You will stay there. I don't care if your numbers plummet until I decide and you are good enough to come back here. Why? 
Build up a weight room culture. Be accountable. Be consistent with your message to the players. Do not pick and choose who you like or don't like. Love them all. They're all going to frustrate you. They're all, you're all going to want to punch those guys in the face, want to slam their head against the wall. Don't do it. You think about it. Don't do it. But love them. Because to them, you are either a male, a father, or for ladies, a mother to them, an older sister. I'm an uncle. I'm a big brother. You'll be shocked about some of the things these kids tell me that they're going through. And it's my job to listen. So I'm always consistent with the message. The message is this. If, you, if teamwork's text always goes out, it's a system we use. Show up at 554 for our team run. They know that means that I got to be there at 554 because if I'm there at 555.01, I wasn't five minutes early. So that's why we're there at 554 because then you're going to be five minutes early. If, they, if we start the lift or the run and it's six o'clock in five seconds, you're late. I don't care if you're walking down the hall because the message said we start at 554. Be there. Be, always be consistent with the message. I've seen too many programs not go well because they're not clear and concise with the expectation of the program. Does everyone ain't really understand if you're a head guy or head female? Does your assistants understand your objectives? I've ran into that before where I'm, I know what's going on up here. I'm saying what to do. And you're like, why is he not coaching that right? And you come to find coach, I really don't understand. Should have probably asked more questions, but I should have probably did a better job of explaining it. Patience, have patience. Every day is going to be a battle. Have patience. Choose your moments. Listen to the kids. Don't always snap back at them. And I had to learn that as I got older. Um, learn. You can learn a lot from your kids. I've learned a ton from them. And then apply. Apply what's necessary. Next one, keep the goal the goal. A lot of people have, lay out their outline, we're going to do all this and that. And then all of a sudden, they hear about, you know, somebody, I hear what Oregon State's doing. I'm like, oh, what are they doing? Oh, shit, we got to change. What? No. His goals are different than my goals. His weight room's different than my room. His needs are different than my needs. So we have to keep the goal the goal, regardless of what he's doing, because he's trying to win too. Coaching culture. We coach cues. We don't have conversations. Two cues. Two main cues for every lift or every speed drill we do with our guys. Once guys get engulfed in our program, they're no longer freshmen, guess what? Then it's like, hey, you know what? You're, you're doing a good job squatting. I want you to pull down that bar and keep tension on that bar as you're squatting and explain to them why really quick because you get really bored if I sit there and go, now when you squat this and that and these muscles take, they don't want to hear that. I got kids from Compton, California, and they could care less about squatting. They want to know how I'm going to help them get to the NFL. I got to find a way. So we coach cues. ABCs are coaching. It's just always be coaching. Always be coaching. I hate this. I hate when my assistants do this. And I'll, and I, and I'll never embarrass the assistant. I'll just walk by them and, butt, and nudge them. Because I always have my, I float the room. I like to see everybody because I want to greet each kid each day. Even if I only see one set, that he knew I was there in his life for one moment that day. Lauren Landa uh, just gave a clinic. Give them what they need, then give them what they want. We had discretionary this week, voluntary lifting. Um, guys were told for health and safety reasons they need to get three workouts in in five days. First two days, my workout. What we're going to do, clean, squat, all the things they need. Third lift, spring break, upper body swole session, because that's what they want. And you know what? Guys complained that I gave them four sets of 12 for a pump on, on bench. But they really want it. So I, they got done the work they needed to get done. Then we give them something fun to do. Jason Lascalzo said this uh, in an interview. We coach attitude, body language, responsibility more than actual strength and conditioning. Think about it. Are you really coaching strength and conditioning those kids? Or are you coaching life, attitude? Squat, squatting down, heavy, life, heavy sometimes. How do you, you know what? The way you talk to coach so-and-so, that's why he's upset with you. How could you have handled that different? I've had more conversations about that than I actually have had about, hey, about this or something like that. Philosophy. If you walk in my weight room and tell me my program's simple, I'll say I'm doing a damn good job because that's all I care about. It is not complicated one bit. We do, are not complicated. Simple, hard, and effective. Those are three words I believe in, and that's the way it's always going to be. That's why I believe in it. Why? Because I was the guy, nothing against the FMS. FMS came out. I jumped on that train. I said, all these corrective stuff's going to, er, we're going to get so much better. Er, wrong. We're neglecting strength for other stuff, taking time away from things that we need to do. This is what I believe in. I didn't, I'm not saying FMS is wrong for you guys. We just import it. We don't test our guys. 
and I'll show you how we look at deficiencies with our guy. Position and posture. First time I ever heard position and posture was from Cam Davidson with weightlifting with a bar. And just talking about position, how you got to hold position, whether you have the bar in your hand or you have your one RM in your hand, it should all look the same. Everybody's like, oh, no, if I put more weight on the bar, it shouldn't swing out. Oh, yeah, it was 10 pounds too light. That's why it swung out. You're right, sure. So position and posture, whether it's in the field or the weight room. For us, technique increases load. I tell the kids, I have a six, seven offensive tackle. I was like, dude, you can bend very well. If your best squat when you leave here is 400 pounds, I am happy with that. Because we need him to play. Because if he gets hurt, I'm going to be unemployed. That's the name of the game. Keep him safe. Whether you're linear, non-linear, I really don't care. We use both. It all depends what my goal is. It all depends on what I got to do. Freshmen that come in the summer, straight linear, straight teach them what we got to do. Straight. They will clean, squat, front squat, and press and pull three times a week. That's all they're going to learn. They aren't going to learn anything else from me. That's all they're going to learn, plus all our field mechanics. Cam told me one time, constantly redefine strength. How do we do that? There's so many things out there. Uh, Cal Dietz wrote a book, Triphasic. We use it. We use it in our peak speed phases, peak condition right before camp. That's the only time I use it. But have, I, have you used parts of it before? Everybody's done eccentrics. Everybody's done isos. Everybody's done concentrics. It's just a fancy name. I'm not knocking Cal. I think he's, a, he's smarter than I'll ever be. But Cam helped me understand that book and say, hey, I can take a piece of that pie and add it to what I need to make our guys better. Where am I at? Uh, functional multi-training, everything is done. We do free weights. I, I'm not saying anything is wrong with machines. I think machines have their place. We have machines in our way, but they are for our injured guys or for our hard gainer guys. So after maybe we're done, and I tell like our guys, like, hey, all you guys got extra upper body. You got 50 reps on machine press, machine pull, machine this, this, and that. Go. Because they're fatigued. The machine will keep them safe, locked in. They ain't got to balance things anymore. It's just a rationale in my mind to keep them safe because I may be working another group while these guys are doing some extra work. Goal is to prove strength and rate of force development all the time with myself. I will, people ask me, when a guy's in his fourth year, what are you working on? We're still working on strength, but I'm going to try to get his rate of force development faster. We'll do some different things. Though. But to me, football is a strong man's game. You've got your dump trucks and you've got your race cars. If I only have so much time with them, I'm going to put as much armor on them as possible because guess what? That dump truck's trying to kill that wide receiver race car if he's a D lineman when he tries to hit him, because he's going to try to smack the shit out of him. So not saying all this other stuff out there isn't good, but it's a strong man's game. And if you're not strong up front where the dump truck's got to hit every play, guess what? You're probably not going to win. Linear and loud development of speed, you know, we develop better general movers. You know, that's, that's all we do. We're not rocket scientists. We develop better general movers. Everybody talks about, oh, no, we go sports specific. Do you really go sports specific? OK. So you shuffle, right? Yeah. Don't basketball players shuffle? Yeah. So how is that sport specific? You're building better general movers, because guess what? If I build a better general mover, when he goes on the field with a linebacker coach, that's sport specific. It's his job to make him a better linebacker, not my job. My job is to teach him better, give him more tools in the toolbox and say, hey, we use these different positions to make you a better general mover, and that's it. My belief, I'm not saying if you want to say your stuff sport specific, you're wrong. I'm just going to chuckle to myself and think, yeah, so do all these other sports shuffle, too. Uh, we combine everything together. The only time we have a pure linear day and a pure lateral day is right now coming up. We'll go into our, our we call it combine prep for the guys. We're done spring ball. They give them something because they got to train five more weeks. Yeah, they have to lift, and it's going to drag on them. So we're preparing them and saying we're going to test you. You know, we'll go clean, squat, bench, and I'll get that done early on. We'll test them in a 10. I don't do a 40 because... They're football players. I don't really care what they run a 40, honestly. I mean, they got to be able to play football, honestly. Um, we'll do a broad jump and we'll do a vertical jump. Why? Because it's measures of power to me, horizontal and vertical. That's all I really need to know. And it gives them something to root for. General to specific multi-directional agility. We go from program drill, so box drill. Everybody knows what that is, just program basic drill. Then we can take the box drill. We can take a short shell program competitive. Why? If me and him are vying for the same position, we got to compete. Isn't that why we do sports? If you, it's nice to say, it's really nice to say, oh, we do it for the love of the game. If we're doing it for the love of the game, why do professional athletes get paid? It's a competitive nature to make money, and I need to stay employed. I would love to retire at CU because Boulder's really nice. I don't know if, you, if everybody's ever been there, but 
A year ago I got there, it's really nice, I'd like to stay there. Then we go to reactive competitive where it's just pure open competition. So every mechanic drill that we worked on, you go now. I'm not coaching. Coaching says, sit, go. They're going, oh, oh, winner. Winner, loser. Recovery. If you aren't eating right and you aren't sleeping, don't talk to me about recovery. Don't talk to me about cold tubs. Don't talk to me about anything else because to me, nutrition is more important in the weight room. I tell our players that all the time. If you are not eating right, we are going to have a really bad day in there with you. If you're eating right and, you're, and things are going wrong, then maybe it's the program. We have a guy not gaining weight. All other guys, we have a guy on the team not gaining weight right now. Everybody else is doing fine. Going along progress. Coach, maybe it's the program. I said, yeah, you're right. You know what? 94 other guys are being successful, and it's just you. So, yeah, you're right. It probably is. The, no, it's you. Well, how do you eat? Oh, well, I only eat two meals on Sunday. Oh, really? Is that all you think you need? Well, what do I else do I need, coach? I finally stood up there. We broke down his meal plan, and I started talking about money to him. And I basically said, I, we, we came up with like 180 bucks. I said, so you get paid in two weeks. I'm going to shortchange you 180 bucks. How about that? Well, that's messed up. He's a different one. That's messed up, coach. I said, then add that in for the last five weeks of training. How much money did you lose? We did all the math. So if sometimes you got to talk to him, because all he's thinking about is the NFL. So if I keep telling him, hey, you're losing money out of your pockets, just cut holes in your pockets and let it keep falling out or give it to me, hopefully he gets on board. And then I believe all those relate to injury prevention. Uh, where am I at? My philosophy, develop a player in three to five years. Why? In three years, they can declare for the NFL. I may not see that player for five years. He plays as a true freshman. The only way his clock will stop if he gets hurt, and if he's really good to play as a freshman, I do not want him to get hurt because he will – not be able to help us win. How do we do it? Genetics. Everybody has different genetics. I tell kids that all the time, if you could be your twin brother, you're going to accept things differently. So we try to look at that a little bit as they get older in the program. Injury history. We have a kid right now coming back from two ACL surgeries coming out of high school. His program right now is a little bit different as a true freshman than it is for the other freshman. Why? Because I still got to account for this because the second one was less than a year ago. Training age, I've ever had two kids that never lifted weights in high school, and one was this, one was this past year that just came in, which is shocking to me, the amount of weightlifting uh, facilities in high school. So we take training age into account, position played on the field. And, that's, and it's the only time when you can say, when, when you try and tell the guys position specific, but it's still not position specific. Split sprints, we have our linemen push sleds. Why? Because they got to move earth all the time, whether you're O-line or D-line. We have our skill and hybrids pull it. That's the only difference if, if you want to say it's position specific. And then condition yards. I will never make an offensive or defensive lineman do hundreds. I, to me, why? I was never 330 pounds. Every side I ever was 235. So I don't know what it's like when coaches hand down, run 100 or 110, whatever you want to call it, and say, great job. You get to do that 22 more times, and then you go home. Not fair to them. It's not what they do on the field. My job is to train football players, not Olympic lifters, powerlifters, bodybuilders. I believe, and that's what I'm looking forward to your talk tomorrow, I believe in the posterior chain. I believe that's where I want silverback gorillas walking out of my weight room because those are strong dudes. I wouldn't, I mean, not that I would mess with a monkey, but silverback gorilla, very fearful looking. If my own child fell into a gorilla pit, uh, hopefully I don't think twice, but I'm probably going to get my butt kicked. Uh, most power athletes are built on the backside. Like we tell our guys, you want to bench, oh, coach, I want to bench 405. Oh, you do? Let me see you do. You came into one pull up. You came a row 135 pounds. So let's think about this. When they build a house, do they put like, it on sand or is it on concrete? Concrete, coach, something strong and sturdy. So what makes you think you can support 405 pounds on this side when this side looks piss poor? So we will always train the back side of our guys more than I will train the front side. Because I tell the guys, your pecs and biceps are for your girlfriends. I say, I could care less about that stuff. You bench 405, great. You squat 500, then we're talking. Uh, needs analysis, increase total, total body power and strength, improve, improve the ability to change directions. If you cannot bend at your hips, knees, and ankles, you can't play. And this is, and this is one thing. I, I had an intern. We've got a questionnaire intern. And we said, what's the most important lift of football? Comes back to the clean, like the kid already said, clean. Then he goes, and if he has great thoracic ankle, I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Maybe he shouldn't even play a sport then. Because we're sitting there arguing now over thoracic mobility, ankle mobility, hip, this and that. Why, are they, why, why do we clear them to play sports? But they can't do a clean. 
to me, a clean is safer than me running that effect. And I'm trying to knock the snot out of him. He's trying to knock it out of me. And the, that's chaos. But we're saying we're going to limit our kids in the weight room. I'll tell you what, you want to improve a kid's hip, knees, ankle mobility, start cleaning them. And maybe he only catches here because that's all he has. Then catch him here. I have a, there was a freshman. Oh, my God, this kid has leaks all over the place. He struggles to squat 135. He is 6'7". He is 290 pounds. And he looks like Gumby when he walks. Everything is just like this. And you know what? We put a bar on his back. It was an empty bar. This is all you're going to do today. We tell him how to squat everything. As low as you can go, maintain a posture. Stand back up. That's all he did. Next week, put tens on each side. Oh, we look good. Let's do another five. And oop, go back to the tens. Now, he's up to 225 squatting because it takes time. Have patience. Day one, week one is going to look really, really bad. Day one, week five, going to look much better than day one, week one. So have patience. So don't sit there and tell me that, oh, well, this, you know, this kid's ankle's locked up. What, what is everybody, if, anybody working flat-footed athletes? Ever? Yeah, I mean, you have. OK, so what are you going to do? I'm, all, I'm hearing all this talk now about flat-footed athletes. What are we doing? Like, are you, who's God in here? Who's going to change their bone structure? I, I have flat feet pretty bad. And I had an orthopedic surgeon tell me, you need to break both your feet. And I have to rebuild both your feet for you to be right. He goes, orthotics really aren't going to do anything for you. I was like, no, I'm good. I've never had a knee injury and knock on wood. So I'm just going to move on with it. Their bodies will adapt. I had a line, we had a linebacker Kansas. When he walked, his knees did this. Never got hurt once. His body knew what to do, so stop saying, I'm going to spend all this time doing this, and you're neglecting all the things like strength training, him, running, jumping. Like I said, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying take a moment to think about where your priorities need to be to develop these young women and these young men. Because I've worked with female teams before, and they love the lift. They'll get competitive as hell. So I'm not just talking that I've never worked with females. So I, I've had the same philosophy with them. Like I said, I jumped on that FMS bandwagon. Not saying anything's wrong with it, but improve mobility and stability of joints through movement. I believe in that. If an athlete cannot move, they cannot play. And Uwe told me that, and, and that's something I stuck with. Improve core strength from the neck to their hips. Intensity of the core training must match the intensity of sports play. Would we all agree that you train your core when you clean, clean your snatch, deadlift, squat, farmer, suitcase carry? Would, would we all agree? I'll tell you right now, you will not walk in my weight room and see our kids doing chop and lift. 30 pounds versus a kick and pick 315 pounds up. Intensity of the sport we're about to play. Dump trucks and race cars smashing each other repeatedly. So that little shoot with 30 pounds, in my opinion, I don't know if I'm matching the intensity of the sports plan. Not saying you couldn't do it if a kid needs some type of extra work, but I'm just saying, where are you going to put your time and effort in? Because I'm restricted to eight hours a week. Sometimes two are taken away by the sport head football coach because they want to watch film. So now I'm down to six. So now I'm down to three days lifting and three days running. I got to be really smart on what we do. That's why everything we do is multi-joint. And we balance our push to pull. We pull every day. And to me, rear, doing reared outrageous is important pulling. Doing incline row and light and making guys hold is important pulling because guess what? Most, your, most of my football players walking like this because, hey, coach, I like the bench. Yeah, I can tell when you walk through the door. Continue to build strength year round. I don't care if it's in season. We're still trying to get it. We're still attacking that weight room. Why? Because we have to be strong. And, and I got this from Louie because I was always sensitive. I, Man, the stories he told me, I, he, I remember, and this is from another coach, said when the uh, Niners played the Ravens at the Super Bowl, Sean Payton walked in the, uh, their weight room because that's where the Niners were training. He thought they were maxing out. That's how heavy these guys are squatting, 500-plus pounds in season. But that built the mentality because that's what the guys wanted to do too. And if you remember the teams back in Harbaugh was there, think of Michigan now, how physical his teams are. That's the mentality and the culture he wanted to set. So I believe, I believe in continuing to build strength year round. Train smart. Intensity of training is dependent on the time of year. Um, I use a pillow pin chart. I know it's built for weightlifters, but I, don't I look at the highest volume possible. I may say for, in for winter, we're going to go 75% of the highest volume, and then I match my set rep scheme up on what I feel is going to work for our guys. And I have my belief in my mind of what I think works for certain things. But that's what I use. We train the big three. The how must improve on-field performance. Great. 
I got a kid to squat 500 pounds. Did it help him? No. So what did I really do for the last five weeks with the kid? So your how must always improve on-field performance. Know where you want to go before you can develop a plan. So if I know where I want to be at the end, every phase before that must help develop the end product. And I'll talk about that when I break down uh, my little lifting chart. Like I said, clean squat and bench, they are, the, they are the focal point of our program. If that's all we could do in the weight room and that's all we had time for, that's what we would do, clean squat and bench. If I could only pick one, we're going to clean. Just what we're going to do. Uh, GPP, so general towards specific work to rest ratios. So in the summertime, when, our, when we get to our plays, what I call the guys, I'm like, hey, we're now we're getting the football plays. It's basically sprinting and change direction. Where we work for five to 12 seconds of work, and we rest, start the highest 45 seconds all the way down to 25 seconds of rest. And that's just to get them ready when we're trying to peak them. Linear lateral speed development, talked about that. Speed, me speed mechanics are reinforced and slow dynamics of a run. I have videos to show you um, that stuff. Um, that's really, we don't do wall drills. We just work on our mechanics when we do slow dynamics and form run. And I, and I stole that from Lauren Landau. He is so smart. If, if you get a chance, I'm, and I'm not trying to plug uh, play, but they have a clinic going on, I think it's the 8th of April in Denver. Landau's speaking there. You can go. You'll learn a lot. Trust me. And Dan, I think Dan Pass speaking there. Uh, who else? Brett Bartholomew. Brett Bartholomew. So there's going to be a lot of juggernauts there. And bet your ass I got my ticket. Um, Deceleration before acceleration. So everybody's like, oh, we got to get faster, get faster. OK, I understand that. But have you taught them how to slow down? Because if I want to improve the ability to absorb and control a force, be able to apply that force again, but I don't know how to slow down. Maybe that's why kids are tearing things in their knees or messing their ankles up. Just my thought. But we work a lot of time on how to decel before we accelerate with our kids. Only guys that work top end speed are skill and hybrid guys. Um, we re re reinforce multiple angles of deceleration. We do a speed cut. We do a power cut. We do what we call an end drill and a sprint to sprint. And then we do some reposition step work. That's basically it, how we teach our guys to change direction besides getting in an athletic position. It's very simple. Why? Because all of us in here probably spend, we would say, minimum 15 minutes a day reading something strength and conditioning wise. I get an hour with my kids. How, let's, say, let's say in a given week I read three hours worth of strength and condition. How much of that three hours of reading can I actually put into the weight room with all these kids? Like, oh, look at this. Hey, hey, what happened last night? Oh, no, pay attention back over here. So I keep everything simple for these guys with Tuesday, no athletic position, because they're all Division I athletes. Get them to feel pain, not scientific all the time. That's what Al Bilberman said, and I love that. Because sometimes it's just about pain. And I'm not talking about uh, making them throw up. Sometimes guys throw up because they, they didn't follow the program when they were home in May. That was their fault, in my opinion. But making, saying, hey, you know what? Today we're just going to have a come to Jesus workout. We ran. They weren't, we were missing a lot of times in the winter this winter. They were slated to run six sprints, um, change direction, 25, uh, 25 uh, excuse me, 75 yard shuttle. So it's 25 and back three times. We ended up running 35. Why? 35 was the number? Because we got our ass kicked in the last two games by around 35 points and we lost. And I told him, we're just going to keep running until you guys figure out what we're going to do. Nobody died. Nobody pulled a hamstring. And hopefully build a little bit of mental toughness along the way. So I, don't, I, I think some people are trying to get, saying, oh, well, it's not scientific. Why are you doing it? You've got to build something up here, because sometimes these kids don't come in that way. Evaluate through vertical jump, 10-yard sprint, and broad jump, like I talked about. We, we weigh in before every workout. I want to see average changes in body weight over the course of a week. We weigh in Monday and Friday. Increase lean body mass, decrease fat mass. We have an awesome nutrition department. Their office is right next to mine. We have two of them. They do body comp two times a year, sometimes three if I need, have a special needs guys. Everything we do from a weight loss or weight gain standpoint is based on if our guys are high performance in the kind of based off the information they tell me. It's not me saying, oh, I think he's too fat. I'm going to go run him more. It's like, hey, Drew, we got to get something done with these guys. Their body fats are right. We talk about sit down, boom, I take their information. They are a great resource. I, was, I forget who, which strength coach told me. It might have been Scott Cochran. I think he gave a talk in the CSCCA and talked about if you want your kids to buy a nutrition, empower your nutritionist. Give her or give him the power. Talk about the assets they bring to your program. And we try to do as great a job as we can because they are awesome. Um, all players must get a recovery shake post-workout, including our weight loss players. 
Uh, training schedule, four to five days a week, depending on time of year. We team run all the time. So I got 95 bodies flying around in the station format. It's all organized the best we can and trying to get work done. Three lifting groups. And now this goes against 95 guys running around because I think we can handle 95 guys running around. But when it comes to the weight room where I think more injuries could occur in terms of, you know, we're doing a behind neck push press and they're supposed to be spotting the guy bringing the bar down. One guy's not paying attention. We got a D lineman uh, spraying his AC. That's why it's small groups. No more than 35 guys. So each coach has maybe nine to 10 guys. Player run practices, they do that uh, two times a week at 6 a.m. And that is uh, all player led. Um, these guys got to practice football. I always tell the guys, at the end of five weeks, you're going to be somewhat bigger, somewhat stronger, somewhat faster, somewhat in better shape. Are you going to be a better football player? Well, yeah, coach, I'm with you. No, I don't coach football. I am just helping Jeremy prepare. Have, when, when was the last time you practiced backpedal? Last season. Well, do you think you're going to be better at your backpedal right now? No. So why aren't we practicing? So it's really organized well through our captains. They do a great job with that. Um, I'm going to switch over to something real quick, so bear with me. So, uh, I've got to make this bigger. So, just going to go over this sheet real quick and then I'll shoot some videos. So, this is our warm up. This is stolen from, from I mean, I've done most, some of the other stuff, but from the hip and slow dynamic, it's stolen from Lauren Landau. If somebody does it really good, I'm going to steal it. I'm going to put my twist on it, what I like and don't like. Because if I showed you Lauren Landau's, the hip stuff is probably 15 exercises long. I don't have the time for that. Not that it's saying those exercises are wrong, but we took the ones that we felt were the biggest ones that we needed to do, bless you, and said this is what we're going to put in our program. Same thing with our slow dynamic stuff. And all it's about is position and posture. If you see the coaching points next to everything, it's very short and sweet as, we, as you go through. And I have videos to show this stuff. So we, it's just, I know it's just a bunch of words right now. And then those are acceleration mechanics. Like I said, that's all our acceleration work. Then we'll go into plyos. This was this uh, past winter. We'll do some med ball stuff. We'll do a weighted march for position horizontal force. To us, if you're in a good position as you're pulling a heavy weighted sled, you're going to put force back into the grind. It's going to teach you how to run faster. Um, rhythm and acceleration. We do ladders. I know ladders are getting, ladders are getting blasted because it's not quick. Kids will do them whether you give them to them or not. It's a low level pile. We've all had uncoordinated athletes that you know what, you put them on a ladder, they get a little bit better. So you know what, I'm still going to use them. I don't care who blasts them. Do I think they're the end all be all? No, but I think they serve a purpose. Just like I still think foam rolling serves a purpose. I don't do it with the guys anymore, but I think it serves a great purpose. And I stress, hey, we just got done working out. Why don't you go roll out? Hey, why don't you come in tomorrow and roll out? I think it serves a purpose. It's just I don't have time for them in the workout we got to do. Then we always do some type of low, low level. When I'm still trying to build speed, I will always do conditioning on the lowest level possible. Why? Because I think your conditioning is going to support, especially from a sports standpoint, your repeated effort to do speed work. All right, I'm going to uh, click over to some videos now. Um, we're going to go, I'm going to do the uh, weight room warm up first. Um, this kid, he, the reason I used him, he is 6'7. It is our active hip flexor stretch. And basically, we just tell our kids to stay stacked, posterior tilt their pelvis instead of being this way, pull it back under, and just rock back and forth, stretch your hip flexor out 10 times each side. I don't count reps. You want to do six, and I don't catch you? And things aren't working well for you, well, how many have you been doing? Oh, well, coach, I really haven't been doing all the reps. These kids are pretty, pretty honest. Well, that's probably why. So I'll play one more time. Like I said, it's just, to me, posterior, tilting the hips, keeping shoulders stacked over top of your hips and knee, and just rocking back and forth. And you'll see when, he's, when he starts standing up for certain things and does the barbell warm-up, this, this kid can bend for 6'7". Wish they all were 6'7 on the offensive line. Uh, pigeon circles is the next one. Basically getting a pigeon stretch, sits back into the hip, clockwise five times, counterclockwise five times. We want them to sit in their hip to help loosen that glute up, loosen their hip up. If guys put their arms on the ground, that's fine. I'd like them to stay as square as possible because a lot of times some guys will get on the ground and they lean to the side and are not square. 
we want them to stay square. So if he has to like almost lay on that front leg for him to stay square, I'm fine with that. Sometimes guys can't get in the right position. We put, we put a roller underneath their leg, help brace them up a little bit more, but just want to get five and five. Uh, what's the next one? Uh, tabletop plank march. Uh, my, one, of my, and I, one of my coaches, he's big into gymnastics, so this is something, I don't know, this is pulled from his repertoire. I like it. We want to externally rotate as far as possible. We'll have our big guys try to go here. We want them to get all the way around, squeeze those shoulder blades together, pick up, stay at 90, toe to, toe to knee, and just hold up their hips as best as possible. The more those kids can squeeze their shoulder blades together, the higher their hips will stay. We're just trying to put them in different positions to open them up because we got to be quick and fast with this stuff. Um, he's going actually slower than what we like in certain things. Then after that, he does those three things. He stands up. Love kettlebells, just don't have the, oh, uh, is that number, this number two. Just don't have it in my budget right now to buy a bunch. So we want to do something with a goblet squat. So I just said, you know what? We're going to use a plate. They sit down. They put their elbow, I say, on their little teardrop bodybuilding muscle, and they just rock side to side to open those hips up. And guess what? I'm trying to open up his ankles a little bit too. That's our ankle mobility. Insert, put him in positions where he's loaded a little bit, and now just have him move around, keeping his chest vertical, and standing. At the end, he would just press his plate over top to work on his overhead mobility. That's it. And I'm not saying everything I'm doing is right. I'm just trying to adapt to what they need to do. So if we're getting ready to clean today, this is what they do. Go through a clean barbell warm-up. So do a bend over row first, five times. So it goes to a RDL pull. And would I like his knees not to bend as much? Yeah, I like him to be a little bit more straight leg. He can stop above the knee, but that's safe for me. He's going to go to a push press, punch, hold overhead. Would I like his head through more? Yes. But those are things I work on as with the guys go. They're not going to, he's not, he's, he's not built to Olympic lift. <laughs> I'd rather him have that wingspan and that length to keep guys off our quarterback. They'll go to a front squat next, just working on position and posture. To me, every time our guys front squat, they're working on core strength. And then the last one I'll just do is a good morning. Like I said, I used him because he is 6'7". And he is not built to be a weightlifter. And, but he can bend really well. And, not, and I wish they all did, but, they, but he don't. So then we go into our warm-up. I actually had the coaches perform. Uh, we all performed this this morning because I needed it for the work for this presentation. So I told them that they weren't getting paid anymore either. So they willingly did it. So this is our hip series. First one is fire hydrant. So let me just talk real quick. So we talked about before, that's the position we're in. You notice my back is a little rounded. Don't really care about that because you know what? I'm just trying to work on getting my shoulder blades away, opening up my T-spine. This is how I learn which guys are tight in their hips, which guys have bad upper body mobility, which guys want to sink down. And so we're getting a little core strength here by staying drawn in the whole time. And it is slow and methodical, squeezing. When guys, you notice the uh, toes are up to the knee. Why? We're just trying to reinforce good running position right there. And we're down on all fours, and we're just moving slow and methodically, trying to feel our way through things. So this is the fire hydrant. We go five on each side. And we do not, we want to tell the guys, we move from the hip, not the low back. Once I start feeling a twist, and they got to learn to feel this stuff. And does it look as good as this with all our guys? No. I got guys over there with a slinky back thinking they're doing great and they're twisting all the way up here and I got to walk up to them and say, no, you got to slow this down. This is the hip circle, kick out straight. My leg needs to be higher, like Coach Layport is in the white. Come out and bring it around. Just make a hip circle. Everything is tight the whole time. And when I went back to Lauren's clinic, this is something that I had to take because I saw it the first time, just went down there to uh, look at stuff. I had to relearn this stuff because we were doing some things not to the specifications he wanted, which I thought were really good. This is donkey kick. If you want to know, guys have tight hip flexors like I do, look where, look where I stop at. That tells me enough where I need to know. 
Um, you want to keep, try to keep the angle at 90 with your hip. Uh, Coach Terrence, he's, he played O-line at and, and, uh, BYU. Pretty good for a big guy getting his knee, all, getting his heel all the way up. Then we go hamstring quick. Biggest thing we get with our guys, they let their hips come flying up and they, keep their, and they bend their leg. Biggest cue, keep the toe to shin, squeeze the quad as you go. If I'm squeezing my quad, it's going to help stretch my hamstring. It's going to hurt a little bit more, but it keeps everything in line and in posture. So even with this, we're trying to reinforce position and posture. This one, we just call it sideline open. I don't get fancy with my words with the guys. Something that they can remember what comes up next when I call it out. With our guys, it's done all on cadence. Why? Because it looks good to the head football coach. Do I think they can do it on their own? Yeah. But head football coach comes out there and wants to see what I'm doing. It all looks good. It all looks uniform. And it's just to reinforce that we're doing good stuff down there. Because everybody wants to say, oh, all right. we all got justify our jobs at some point or another. So another thing, too. Now you impress your uh, coaches, and, and I I've heard three head coaches say this to me. Man, so-and-so looks like they're really working hard. His arms look bigger. Like, his squat got better, too. I just build their – we always do arms. Why? Because football coaches think if their arms get bigger and better looking, they're working really hard. They don't care how much they clean, honest to God. Um, this is a rocker to V. So work, work on kicking the legs overhead, overhead straight, reaching back through, working on upper body, T-spine mobility. This is all our corrective stuff. This is all our evaluation stuff. This is how we, we do not spend, we'll spend time in between lifts doing little things, but we don't have a corrective group for T-spine mobility. All our guys have issues with T-spine mobility. They're big sons of guns. Even our little guys have issues. Uh, uh, the coach in the back needs to keep his legs straight and we work on all that stuff. So next one. Slow dynamics, this is where we force position and posture. And like Lauren told us, not saying way you were taught was wrong, because everything he taught me was opposite. So we just go with a knee hug. The only thing we're doing is actually bringing our leg up and driving our foot down into the ground. We're trying to work on this leg, that's it. I was taught this. The higher I get, the more I'm stretching. Can't work on position and posture, and running mechanics with that. So the only thing I'm at, we're really doing is just bringing this up and driving everything back down, trying to balance on that leg, position and posture when running. Because most kids don't know how to drive back into the ground. Next one, just be a figure four. Like I said, only thing we will coach is that down leg. Some guys have to bend down. Lauren said that wasn't a big deal. And I'm going to give him credit for this. I stole it from him. It works really, really well. So if you can steal something from somebody, use it. A lot more smarter people out there than me. I'll, I'll give him credit three times for it, and then it's mine. I always say that. So if I take some of yours, I'm giving you credit three times, and then it's mine. This is quad pull and reach. Like Coach Layport, he's a big, he's a, he's a short, stocky dude, but he's big. He has trouble, he can't do it. And I asked Lauren, but Lauren's like, I don't care. As long as they get back to position and posture when they're tall, it doesn't matter how they get their leg. He goes, he goes, you think all your offensive linemen are going to be able to do all that correctly? I was like, no. He's like, well, then don't, don't, don't major in the minors. Take his hamstring kick next. And we only want to bring the leg up as high as we can. We're just really working on straight leg up, striking down, but staying strong on that down leg. We don't care about anything else as we're moving through. And all the other times, we'll tell our kids straight leg, and they bring it up like this. We had to, re we had to change a lot of things with our guys. Do they all do it 100% correctly? No. It's never going to be that way. Hamstring, called staggered RDL. Coming through with the hips as you sweep, working on overhead mobility at the top. That's when we're going to do it. Yes, we do it in the weight room with the bar when we're pushing overhead and trying to work our head through. We have other things we do with a rack slide, but it's minor and it's paired in a warm up with things that we do. I'm not, like I said, I don't have, I got to find time to get their neck in. I got to find time to get all this other stuff in. I don't have time to do that stuff because I believe I can build all that stuff through movement. And my other thing is, I, to I, had, uh, I tore my leg in my rotator cuff. I regain mobility as I regain strength in the shoulder. So I'm sitting there going, I can't even bring this behind. I can bring it back there now as I gain strength. And mo that's where I gain my mobility. Because think about it, your body's not going to put you for safety reasons and end ranges it can't control. It can't lift you to actively. 
Uh, and just everybody see the inchworm. Uh, biggest thing on this, Lauren says, walk up flat footed. And when you drop your hips, just don't over hyperextend. But I love all the stuff that we learned from him. I'm probably running long. Apologize, Lon. That's it for that. Um, Go over real quick. So this is what my staff sees what, before we meet. Because I build the first part of the program, and then this is what my staff sees, and we meet, and we talk about it. Because I, I could be missing some things. How do I, am I going to do this? I could be missing some things in what we need to do. This is what we did this past winter. We always get our neck in. Machine guys, defense one day, manual with the coaches another day. Coaches do it. Why? Because players aren't going to do it for each other. And I really don't care about his neck. I just really care about my neck. So I'm probably not going to do a good job with him. That's, that's what I was told once. So that's why the coaches do it. We clean. After they warm up, they clean. They'll come in and do mobility with a rack stretch. All they're just putting a bar on a guy's back, holding on with the grip, and rolling through. Help them work to reinforce the front rack position. All right? This, this winter, we broke everything up today, what I call it Olympic days and pulling days and post-chain days, and then pressing and front side days. Um, we'll do a snatch pull progression. Our guys have not snatched yet. I got, when I got fired from Maryland, Rick Court took over. Rick Court does not Olympic lift. I, I emailed Rick Court. I was like, man, I, I want to see what he, he thinks so I can get better as a strength coach about what he inherited, talked. Hey, Drew, I don't believe in Olympic lifting. Some of the things with shoulders, I think we could, you know, that, his big thing is with shoulders and low backs so with we'll Olympic lifting. I said, okay. We still Olympic lift, but it made me go back and rethink on things that can be doing more for their shoulders and more things that can be doing a little, for their low backs and helping to protect and help building things up. So the way we teach our snatch progression now, we start with just the pulling. Start with deadlift and just go through a pull progression from the floor. While they're doing that, they got a PVC pipe. Just doing shoulder dislocates, bringing it as far as they can over the head. Then we work into overhead squat, and it probably looks just like this, and they get a little bit lower as they can keep going all the way down. Then when we come back post-spring ball, now we're going to go into a very starting probably with the bar. I'll, probably te I'll teach them how to miss first, because um, Mike Bergner gave a great story about ending a uh, Division I football player's career because he forgot to teach how to miss when the kid was lifting with them. And he says, one thing you do, teach kids how to miss. Teach them how to miss first. Then we'll go into a light snatch push press. So they get used to holding the bar over their head. Because all these kids right now, they're nervous about doing snatch. They've already told me that. Then we'll go into snatching. So we all need to get better. So what I'm saying is call up people that are different. I knew Rick didn't believe in them. Believe in them. I knew that. But I want to hear what he thought from that standpoint. Then we go into ice centric chin-up pull-up. Basically all it is is guy, skill guys are going to pull and hybrids pull up, hold for one count, lower down three seconds, bring back up. All our linemen, a lot of the guys are weak. They, you tell a big 330-pound guy to hold himself up top for two seconds, he can't do it. He really can't. So how do we get him stronger? Well, everybody's like, we're going to go to inverted rows. Sometimes they can't do those correctly. So basically, we have them climb the rack. We hold here, and there's a partner behind helping if they need help. And we just did a progression with that, which I thought worked pretty well. Did a glued ham, and then we did some type of horizontal rowing. You see, ISO three second front squat. Why did we hold in the bottom for a front squat when it was a high volume? Why? Because my goal in the end is to test them on a one RM and clean. So I got to get them to learn how to, how to be able to be strong sitting down here. And guess what? I'm getting my core training in that I need. Because if you can't hold whatever your weight is here and keep it up right chest, you have weak abdominals. If you bend over, you have weak abdominals. So the end goal was to test the one RM. That's the only lift we test the one RM is the clean. Why? Because they will technically fail before they actually hit their true max. Squat, bench, 90%, three reps, ma ref, uh, excuse me, max stays the same. Everything above that, it gets bumped up a percentage pound. Get some hip flexor work in, bench, external rotation, press overhead in military. With a barbell reverse lunge, get some single leg work in. Barbell kill, tricep rope, press down. Why? Because co football coaches love arms, and so do the players. And they did everything else that I needed, so you know what? I'm going to throw them a bone. Come back Thursday, we hang power clean now. Pull from the hang. 
Same percentages, weight's gonna be a, be a little bit lighter. Behind the neck push press, they're learning that right now. Why are they holding it for two seconds over top? To build overhead strength more because they're not, this is what you're gonna see. They're never gonna gain overhead strength. We do a clean grip RDL, we do a dead hang neutral uh, grip pull up, and then we do some more row and flip, which you did the other day. Get neck done again, come in volume, volume squat on Friday with another mobility. We incline now, it's a, it's a little lower incline with internal rotation, get some more single leg work in, some shoulder. Basically, two way shoulder raise, close grip bench, tricep face pull, dip, and double hammer curl is to make those guys walk out of the way like they want to wear tank tops in the middle of winter, to make them feel like gods. Why? Because they just put a lot of work in that week, and if they feel like a god walking around campus and somebody tells them their arms look bigger, they buy in more. I get guys to buy in with squatting with me more by walking over when a kid's doing arms and saying, hey, why don't you try this? Just go down three seconds a little slower, or turn your grip this way. Do the reps. Hey, do 12 reps. How would that feel? Oh, man, coach, I, I never felt that before. Guess what? When you tell him how to squat now, he's going to listen to you because you told him how to get bigger arms. you got to buy into what they believe in, which I'm not saying is always correct. You know, if it's just about arms, we wouldn't win a lot of games. I'm wrapping up, Lon. I'm sorry. Uh, how do I get booked? Uh, I think here. So try to fly through this. Apply and keep it simple, smart. I'm telling you right now, if you, if you left the weight room and saw the workout, you say, man, Coach, that, that was really simple and basic. Um, we're doing a great job. Teach what you know. If you don't know Olympic movements, use plyometric, use med balls, use what you know. Everybody wants to use Olympic movements, but they don't know how to teach them. Or find somebody that can help coach you. Be a sponge of knowledge. It's out there. But make sure you know you're getting it from the right people. Make sure they're authority on it. Like I said, I thought I knew how to Olympic lift. Oof. Cam Davidson told me otherwise, and I'm grateful and debt to him today. Coach technique, not to wait. Who cares what's on the bar? You get that freaking offensive tackle hurt because you're trying to make a 400-pound squat, not going to be there very long. The re design your training program on what's best for your program. Like I said, we're, we're going to play each other. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm coming to his house this year. Oh, what are you guys doing? Oh, we're doing this? Oh, you know what? We need to be doing that because that's what he's doing. We're going to play. No, different goals. Player, Buddy Moore said this. Players' bodies are constantly talking. Are you listening? They're talking to you every day there in the weight room. And something that he said, which I thought was kind of funny, but it's actually true. When guys walk in the weight room, or females walk in there and they're really quiet, they're beat up. They're tired. They, they're not ready to lift. Guess what? They walk in chat and ah, 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 they're ready to go. So, you know, if you're ready to get after it, they're ready to get after it. But sometimes you got to put it in, in them. Sound program, repair leaks, but remember, you're not God. Mike Bergen, I love this quote. Comfort is the difference between the way things are and the way we expect them to be. Comfort is an illusion. It's neither present nor welcome here. That's the mindset to me of a great strength conditioning program. Uh, honestly, all my references are with conversations with people that I've had. I mean, I've learned more, honestly, from conversations than any book I've ever read, besides, uh, besides the book Legacy. There's one book I can ever recommend to people to read. If you want to learn about leadership and culture, it is the book Legacy. I've read it three times because I wanted to learn more, and you'll learn something new each time. It's about the All Blacks rugby team, the most successful rugby team. That's my contact. Sorry I took too much time, Lon. Um, if there's any questions, I'll be around all weekend. But thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Hey, I tell you what, we got time here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna turn right around.